uh, then we're going to ask uh, how these those molecules come come uh, appear in these kind of states. Does those stores have enough time? Does it have the right condition, temperature, and density uh, to allow those molecules to be formed? Which is that methanol line? What is the frequency? This one? Uh, yeah. Uh, that one's 243 yards. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's pretty high excitations. Um, no, that one's not. That one is about the E of is like 50 or 40 dollars. Yeah. And I'm surprised to see the peak on the black side. So what is yeah, it? we don't know what it is. We're still trying to figure out. Yeah. Yeah, so this is this is a kind of one of the preliminary plots we, we're trying to figure out. Yeah. Alright, so the the big question that we will try to answer or try to ask is uh, does those complex organic molecules exist in every uh, protosteric system, and if so, or if not, how abundant they should be, or they are, um, in those young growth stars. So I would just give a very quick, uh, like two sentences to summarize um, for the rest of the talk first, and sort of guide our uh, trajectory uh, in the next hour. Um, so uh, as you will see later, uh, this this the, the survey I'm going to talk about primarily today is called PG survey, and what we found is basically like. These complex organic molecules, also people tend to call it TOMS, are very common in young pro stars, especially methanol, basically detecting uh, everywhere. And the abundance ratio of these comps uh, to methanol, basically, is a normalized uh, abundance ratio. Um, it's a bit higher uh, than those uh, uh, archetype sources, like the source, like well known sources uh, that we uh, first discovered these complex organic molecules. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. Uh, so uh, we need to uh, try to overview what's, uh, what's complex organic molecule before we can kind of dive into the, the detail of it. So um, complex molecules in the definition of the, uh, the annual review by Erickson and Schiff in 2009 is like we um, kind of arbitrarily determined that, okay, a molecule has to be complicated, uh, complex once you have six or more atoms and um, the, the terminology of organics is just basically being carbon bearing. And from our understanding so far, 100% of detected species with six atoms, with more than six atoms, are organics, like uh, just from the, the discovery we have uh, with them so far. So this is a very simple uh, kind of empirical uh, definition. And then, but then there's a, there's a kind of two flavor of this complex organic molecules. There's a saturated one and there's an unsaturated one. Um, the saturated one means that they are richer in hydrogen. Basically, uh, all of the hydrogen is bonding to other atoms with a single bond. You don't have uh, double bond or triple bond. So that, um, say, one carbon atom can have uh, four bonds coming to, to other atoms. So in that way, um, the saturated complex molecule uh, so are richer in hydrogens. And the unsaturated one are pure in hydrogen, and they are Atoms are con tend to connect in double bond, triple bond, or forming th these kind of carbon chain. Um, so these are like primarily two type of uh, um, complex molecules. Uh, in the talk today, I will primarily focus on the saturated one uh, for now. Um, so most of our terrestrial organic molecules tend to be saturated or close saturated. So we don't really see a very long carbon chain molecule on Earth. Um, so here's a, a trick here. So People typically call these saturated molecules like complex organic molecules. And which we think that by definition, the unsaturated one is also com complex and organic. So it should be called complex organic molecules, but that's not uh, how people typically call it. Some people typically call it a carbon chain molecule or long carbon chain molecule to try to emphasize the, definite, the, distinct, uh, the difference between saturated and unsaturated. So why we care about these molecules, like why, why we need to pay attention to these very complex molecules. But the very obvious reason is they are, as you, the molecule get more and more complex, they are more um, similar to uh, organic life, basically. Um, so one of the, uh, there are a few species that people try to look for. Some, some have success, some uh, we haven't found it yet. So one of them uh, that we have found is a few sources like aldehyde, which is a precursor of RNA. And then, this is one of the simplest sugar related species, uh, look like that. Um, so it has been discovered in some of the high mass uh, protostar, for instance, here. This is NGC uh, 
6233 or I, this is Orion. And it has also been discovered in a few uh, low mass first stars as well. So at least we know that uh, the step be before forming RNA, uh, the ingredient is available in those systems. But whether it actually takes the step to move into forming uh, uh, sort of organic life or prebiotic molecule is still um, in question. Another molecule that I really uh, we have been trying to find it for maybe a few decades, but still we haven't found a confident detection is glycine, uh, which is uh, one of the simplest uh, amino acids. And so it's intriguing because one is amino acid, we know human body is full of amino acid. And then we also identify uh, glycine from comet before. And so people are trying to look for it, and as well as uh, kind of motivated by the detection of molecules with similar structure. So like acetic acid that have this COH uh, structure here, or amino acid and nitride, they also have uh, the similar structure here to kind of make a connection here. So it, it's, it's very motivated. We really want to find glycine here, but so far uh, it has been a little bit elusive. There have been tries to claim it before, but there also have been um, debates about uh, those detections. So what about the the kind of status of a complex organic molecules in low mass sources. Um, so for those sources with complex organic molecule, rich in complex organic molecule, um, oftentimes we call it cocorinos, uh, which basically Italian standard of a small hot floor. Um, although this is specifically mean that uh, the complex organic molecule is populating sort of in the inner region of the envelope, mostly due to uh, thermal absorption. Um, there's other uh, scenario where you might have outflow that is uh, creating shocks like sputter um, methanol off the grains. Um, so there's other scenarios that in question we we'll try to uh, uh, figure out whether they are actually different scenario there and does that, and try to look into whether different scenario create a chemistry. So the uh, the hot green nodes they are like I said they are rich in complex organic molecules so they are rich in saturated complex molecules. Um, they, uh, they sometimes have a similar chemical abundance of hot core, which is basically a massive, uh, massive hot core, so it's massive for stars. Uh, but the ratio of the sum molecules are distinctively different. So um, their modeling efforts try to uh, uh, approach on both sides to see uh, whether radiation, the high radiation in massive source is a, uh, give you a, a slight edge on a certain uh, abundance ratio of molecules. Um, there have been several sources. We have found um, complex organic molecules in low-mass sources. Uh, so here I just list a bunch, but I believe there's a lot more that I can uh, include here. Um, so here's one example uh, that uh, I've been worked on before. This is BHR71. And so while we're using uh, other lines, as simple organics, as CS, um, HCl plus HCN to try to grow kinematics, at the same time, we can easily see there's a lot more lines around, and uh, of many of them, we uh, we identify as a co uh, complex organic molecule. So there are kind of you cannot really uh, ignore them once uh, you appear in your data or you appear uh, in the source. Um, so there are some survey on kind of smaller scale surveys trying to uh, go for maybe a subset of a, a larger survey or. Um, uh, Try to look for a statistic or occurrence rate of those complex organic molecules in low mass source. Um, so then, if we go back to the kind of basic um, kind of formation path of the complex organic molecules, although there's still um, a lot of efforts been trying to uh, put in this to kind of work it out, but I think this is the kind of a, a broad picture of the formation of the columns, where you basically have in a very colder uh, early stage of pre or core. Uh, a lot of freeze out is going to happen. You have uh, molecules basically freeze out on a dust gram and form an ice layers there. And further hydrogenation can happen there. So you might have methane ice, you might even have methanol ice there. And then um, once the temperature warms up a little bit, those, those uh, radicals on the ice can, because the higher, slightly higher temperature, they, they can move around, they have better ability to move around to have a reaction with other radicals. So that uh, these grain surface reactions could uh, kind of populate uh, the ice on the dust grain has to be 
to have more complex organic molecules. And then once the temperature is beyond about 100 Kelvin, those uh, ice layer become uh, molecules in the ice will be dissolved into a gas phase uh, where you can either just like say you have methanol ice and then you become uh, methanol gas, or uh, further gas uh, gas phase reaction can happen in, a, in once the temperature is high enough. But uh, one tricky thing is that um, a lot of observations we found that if within complex organic molecules mostly formed through uh, gas based reactions, uh, the time scale, we don't have enough time uh, for those math for those complex organic molecules to be formed um, to match um, the abundance ratio we have observed. So to put into a kind of like a evolutionary graph, uh, this is a, a modeling that um, uh, done by Aitawa in 2013, where they started from the crystal core, uh, so that's before the formation of star, so that you see comets and minus. And I'm, here I'm highlighting the gas phase uh, methanol here. You can see um, before you only have very little uh, and high temperature region, and as the um, the system evolved, you have a methanol populating in larger, larger region. And, and obviously, you can also see, for instance, uh, as the other high here, um, it was ice before and then um, gas phase, which is side of line, and you have higher and higher um, as the other high um, abundance. So, why I keep talking about methanol for a bit? Because methanol is actually pretty critical in terms of um, further formation of methanol, so, uh, complex organic molecule. So uh, sometimes people will call methanol as like a, a parent species uh, for all of the complex organic molecules. Uh, as you can see here, with either photo dissociation or a radical reaction, uh, basically uh, perhaps on dust grains or gas grain reactions, uh, you can starting from methanol it can, it can form a variety of uh, uh, complex organic molecules. And so that's why we need to we need to survey the methanol as well as other uh, daughter species to figure out uh, whether a certain pathway of chemistry is, uh, is being uh, enhanced in, in certain source or um, we can kind of need to use kind of the, the starting point and the end point to constrain uh, the chemical pathway that occur in between. So, and also this complex organic molecule is not only useful for chemistry, also useful for uh, Doing kinematics. So, this is an example. I think people here are probably very familiar with this source already. Uh, uh, Xingfei, in, uh, a few years ago, uh, detected methanol in HH2 uh, sort of on the upper and uh, upper layer of this, uh, where he is able to uh, figure out there's a rotation uh, structure there, and perhaps there's some um, capillary rotation here, or maybe info. So, because Complex organic molecule, like I said before, it will remain in the ice phase um, before when temperature is below 100 Kelvin. So when when we see the emission of those complex organic molecules, you are not uh, you are basically not sensitive to envelope or anything uh, outside of uh, this 100 Kelvin radius. And that 100 Kelvin radius, um, coincidentally, is very similar to the size of a disk forming region or the inner envelope or perhaps the disk. So uh, this provides sort of an intrinsic uh, filter of, of larger scale, and so that we can use these molecules. Say, we know this is mostly coming from the inner part. And there's a similar example in a high mass source uh, in this G328 source. Uh, the author here also used methanol to uh, try to probe the rotation structure here. But as you can probably tell here. Uh, we still want to have high resolution of this, uh, this uh, for this position velocity diagram to fully uh, resolve the kinematics here. It can be also useful for um, constraining outburst synchronous stars. So uh, they have been after try to uh, look for one of the outburst synchronous stars when uh, this protostar recently experienced a, a burst of a, uh, accretion. And so uh, naively, we think a burst of accretion, accretion would, would increase the luminosity so that will push the 100k radius outward and then kind of settle down back. We'll try to see if there's a chemical uh, kind of footprint uh, left from this accretion burst. So VA3 Aurea is, is one of the known outburst source, 
And in Lee et al. in 2019, they observed uh, methanol um, where they compared to um, the current luminosity and previous luminosity. I think it, it can be due to um, the outburst of uh, uh, accretion. And simultaneously, so other studies by Ben Hoff in 2019 as well, um, they kind of look into this in, in, in the slightly different angle, but similar. Basically, you can derive what's the radius of the methanol. And then uh, if we know um, the dimension structure much better, we could de derive, let's say, comparing this radius to uh, snow lines of other molecules. Um, so, but we still need a better uh, model for, for this source in particular to, to be able to make a claim that this is actually due to uh, the outburst. Um, so for me, I think uh, all of these can kind of summarize in, the, um, in this kind of cartoonish graph. Basically, we have a linear um, thought about how the prosterior uh, pro system will evolve from pre steric core to pro steric core and to this. And we also have complex raw molecules observed in all of these stages. Um, so we want to know that does this chemical diversity at first phase or in every phase, um, does it has, it's because it has different uh, formation history? It's because maybe they stay in the cool phase a little bit longer, or um, it forms like different way, faster, faster inflow, slower inflow. Um, and then, um, say we observe complex reaction molecule to our pearl star, uh, are, they, are those the same molecules we're going to see uh, appear in the disk, or there's, there's some reset going on between phases? So basically, uh, kind of the broad picture here is so we try to figure out whether those complex organic molecules are encouraged uh, from previous uh, uh, stage, or uh, there have been multiple disruption events. Uh, so like say, methanol is up here appear and then destroy and then you form new methanol uh, so that um, the abundance and everything uh, of the imprint from previous stage can be erased. So um, recently they, oh, there's uh, been a very interesting study uh, looking into the complex organic molecule in the comet. Um, so this is a famous source in 67P uh, observed by Rosina on Rosetta uh, satellites um, where uh, Maria here tried to compare uh, the, let's see, yeah, so the complex organic molecule ratio, uh, no wise to methanol, in one of the very uh, typical source of the hot arena was uh, IR6293, and compared to that number is observed in the comet. And you can see for the CHO bearing molecules, it form very nice, sort of like almost linear relation, suggesting that they are. Um, they have a similar ratio. And for the nitrogen bearing one, um, you also look pretty well, uh, kind of like consistent with this linear trend, but you can see there's a lot more uncertainty uh, because of uh, upper limits. Uh, for the uh, phosphorus and sulfur species, which I'm not sure here, the correlations become a little bit worse. Um, but the, the very tight correlation here uh, between um, uh, basically, observation measurements were to two totally different uh, uh, objects in different stage, but show very good correlation. Suggests that comet can actually um, still have um, it's basically contain the material from the pristine uh, prosterior envelope. There's also other uh, sort of comet surveys uh, for uh, complex related molecules, and um, so they survey these many many different molecules and. So showing this, the green line here is low mass source, this is high mass sources here, and the blue and black shows the, the minimum maximum value depending on. So just pay, so most of them are really similar, but uh, so there's a few uh, worth noting things. One is that uh, for acetaldehyde and ethylene glycol, uh, it seems a little bit richer in comic, uh, while the other hand, uh, heating here, uh, comet has a much lower value. So, while in the in the broad view, the, the comet uh, composition is similar to um, to protostars, uh, there's still a significant difference in certain molecules. Perhaps if it, this is probably uh, where we start to need to invoke in uh, chemical model to figure out 
whether there's a certain pathway being affected uh, throughout the evolution. So is this result expected? Especially in the previous slides, I'm really surprised that the common ratio is so tightly correlated with the measurement from another laboratory. You know? So it means like you quickly need this, well, the chemical network quickly saturates to a certain stationary stage, and then it never evolves. Yes, it I guess it really depends on where the comet is forming. Uh, if the comet is forming a very outer layer of this, uh, it's not, it does not go through too much of a thermal processing. So, say it's staying in the edge of the disk and it just never be accreted and it's not going to be affected by the inner, uh, basically the temperature it experiences is more or less the same. Somehow it has to achieve that very common abundance ratio that every source. Yeah, yeah. So, there yeah, so we also find, uh, in our survey we also find similar things, like some, mm -hmm. some species are just really, really tightly correlated and so suggesting that you will either the chemistry is very similar or there's a, another kind of more dominating factor we're missing here. So what is the chemical model telling us? So like in those high like, carbon models, mm -hmm. I see all the, those lines are very like crazy over time. So I, I do see. So like, from my understanding, those chemical models are heavily uh, dominated by your input physical structure. Mm -hmm. So. Um, from what I'm saying, you can pretty much, for a given source, you can come up with a model to match that. Mm -hmm. So I don't think at this point we we know what the chemistry is supposed to be like uh, for these sources. That means none of the existing model predict that kind of like quasi stationary stage that every source should at some point saturate. Right? Yeah, yeah, because you can you can play with different uh, models in modeling to have different results. Yeah. Yeah, but the, the alcohol, though, uh, it's not like by the warm-up, right? Yes. Like, 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 going up and down, like, like crazy just because... Yeah, that, that's big, yeah. So, uh, when you talk about, like, ice composition being the same, okay, we're talking about different story. Mm -hmm. So, when there's warm-up going on, then it's, it's supposed to, like, go up in gas right? Yeah, but this source, I, I 2.2 B is one of the warming up salts, right? So it's an ongoing run for you know, so why it doesn't give you a crazy abundance ratio? I mean, if you go yeah, back to the previous slides. After so. the warm up, the gas is. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, the, the, so one, can, can you go back to the previous slide? So, yeah, so I'll move to the next one. Yeah, so on the last panel, of the vertical axis, the uh, gas phase measurement is supposedly. Or Those ice. are, I think, this uh, volatile, so that's, that's gas emission. This, uh, oh. It's detected from mass spectral. Yeah. Oh, okay. ah, so the, the horizontal, but well, so that, that is a very freshly released molecule from from the surface of that comet. Yeah. Right? yeah. It's more likely to be like the same with the solid phase yeah. on the ratio. So then we are comparing the gas phase measurement of the hot corino with the solid phase abundance ratio and then see the high correlation. Yeah, but the after warm up, if it reaches a certain temperature, then all the ice is supposed to evaporate. So mm -hmm. the abundance should match the, the solid. Solid phase. Right? So in the model, so we expect in the solid phase, so all the um, chemical abundance ratio saturate to a certain value and then become like stationary over time. Uh, in the model, uh, ice is not necessarily so. Mm. I think yeah. from the yeah, I think from speecher speecher survey, the ice composition also vary for a bit, but I don't know the number of that. But um, the evolution, the composition of ice is determined by how much time do you, you have uh, mm -hmm. ice layer there, like what's the time scale of that, and, yeah. and what kind of environment you're in to capture ice. Mm -hmm. And so um, hopefully James Webb can solve that for us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hopefully I'm not all the time. Um, OK, so like I said, uh, like Baba was saying, R6293 is a very 
typical source of hot grain known is an explanatory source of hot grain known. And I just discovered this, this new paper yesterday where they resolve these two sources. So the A source, is, the, so this is the entire uh, R6 genome free system. This is the B source where we uh, found a lot of, lot of complex radio molecules. And A source also shows complex molecules. And now this author here was able to resolve and then derive some orbital constraints. So that's pretty cool. <clears throat> so, but the point here is that B source here shows here, and compared to A source, you can see B source has a fairly narrow line width. So that's really uh, increase our, our ability to identify the small molecules. While in A source, you also see a lot of lines, but uh, for instance, uh, you don't see uh, something like, like this. You don't see this small small peak here. So you lose, or you you, you need to, it's more difficult to identify the species. But now. We, if we can use R693 B source as a template, and then we can test um, the abundance to other sources as well. Um, so uh, the magnet and at all 2020 actually derived the abundance ratio between <clears throat> A source and B source here. So you can see some of them are very similar, uh, but some, some molecules are uh, very quite a bit, by maybe order of magnitudes. So, um, so I guess the, the, the verdict is still still not. Uh, we still haven't reached the conclusion of whether even for the binary system, uh, we see similarity of chemistry, but also we see difference in chemistry. So this, uh, I don't think we uh, we still need to go a little bit, uh, kind of go for maybe a large number of statistics for this binary source in detail, um, or from the modeling side to actually work out to see uh, what it is difference makes sense. Um, complex molecules are detecting isolated source. Uh, so P355 uh, is one of the example. It's a very low mass source, a uh, very low luminosity source, and so show very rich com uh, complex organic molecules. Uh, on, the on, the hand, on, on the other hand, as a wider source, uh, which also show complex organic molecules. So um, we already see here this is more or less a common uh, feature here. Uh, on, once you can once you have the right condition to observe it, you should get it, basically. Um, so now we're moving to uh, uh, to talk about some of the survey uh, prior to ours. And uh, a few years back, there's some single dish survey, try to survey a, a group of uh, uh, young student objects, uh, pro star and low mass YSOs, where uh, uh, Brooklyn and Elfam here, um, for instance, um, you can see there have been very small numbers for the complex organic molecule. For HNCO, is detected for pretty much every source, but say for methyl cyanide, it's kind of a mixed bag of things. Um, I've got a, I mean, maybe some trend, but there's only like six sources here. Uh, recently, uh, Lo Shannon published the, the complex organic molecules in Calypso survey, where they have better constraint on, on the on uncertainty and have more detections. Um, so they, they found very tight correlation between, say, methanol. Methanol is, is showed everything here in the y-axis. Uh, so meth, uh, yeah. So methanol over methyl cyanide have a very good relation, correlation, uh, like methanol versus amines of ether, a pretty good correlation. Methanol, but you can see that this uncertainty get pretty large once you you're down to like a few few detections. Um, so we already see here that there's some similarity, not even for um, um, sources across different states, but also uh, sources in the same state, there seems to uh, kind of form some uh, trend or like forming a group uh, for the, uh, the bond, uh, column density of complex organic molecules. Uh, just putting a slightly different view of that, um, Brooklyn in 2019 also performed a smaller survey to, for a few surface sources where they basically discovered the three uh, new uh, hot Um So they found out this, uh, the ratio to methanol for these molecules are actually larger, higher, higher than those uh, typical hot Grignos here. So these are IR-16293, IR-4A, 2A. Um, so you can see they are consistently higher uh, than the, uh, the hot Grignos which we have found before. So it kind of calling the question about whether uh, the chemistry we detected in those archetype source are they really uh, represented representative of the entire population, 
or we, we actually need to do a survey to figure out what's uh, scattered uh, between those compositions. So you might think, okay, complex of the molecules are, are there. Um, uh, we should look for it, and once we, if we look harder enough, we should see it. But there's also other things issued on the way. So recently, there's another study trying to look for methylene class one source. Um, so this is basically gathered with their source showing in C2H. Um, so they will try to look for a mission like this red line here, this red spectrum here, and which is their model prediction. And the blue spectrum is what they observe. So they see little of methanol in class one source, where you think about, if you think uh, complex organic molecules like being there and maybe also still there in the later phase in this or even in comet, uh, this uh, observation kind of is really puzzling to understand like, why we don't see um, methanol in class one stage. Yeah, that's a strange part, right? And then you see the correlation. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, so, yeah, I personally don't know what, what why it is, but there's a lot of speculation you can do, like whether it's a regular transfer effect or, or stuff, no. or other things. So, the water flow, complex organic fraction in the ice So, if you actually measure the water emission for this target, you don't see the water mm -hmm. at all. So, that means that the water. Um, Emitting region is much smaller than what people thought for black zero. So they should really compact in the being there with it. Yeah. Okay, so now we're finally going to our survey. Uh, so this is the Perseus <clears throat> Alma chemistry survey, also known as Peachy survey. And uh, uh, we survey unbiasedly for 51 class zero and one for a star in Perseus. So here to show where we're surveying, uh, this is NGC 3 and other regions as well. And uh, we using Ben6 to target uh, like a selection of the line. We're now doing a wide band line survey here. We try to get first get a sense of uh, the richness of the source. So and so we targeting a few uh, and typical complex organic molecule and also some simple organics. Um, so we have the beam size about 0.4 to 0.6 seconds and a uniform line sensitivity of about 6 milligrams per beam. And the source selection, I think is looking for all of the source have um, more than one solar luminosity, uh, or more or less one solar luminosity. Um, yeah, so for 44.6 parsec in Perseus, if we take 300 parsec, which is a more reviewed uh, recent number, uh, that put us about 150 AU. So we're actually looking at about 150 AU around the source. So this is just a gallery of all the source we detected in continuum. This is Ben 6 continuum. Um, see, we, there's, a, there's three bright sources here, and multiple sources here, and also some isolated, pretty weak ones. Um, so what we did for looking to complex organic molecule is we, we first assumed that Okay, uh, we want to look for those complex organic molecules. Uh, it's being thermally disorbed from the uh, uh, from the ice, so they are they should be around the continuum uh, peak. So we basically just fit a, a, a two D Gaussian to the continuum source and take the the full and half max of the the region as our uh, sort of mask, and then we we, we extract the spectrum uh, from those regions. So you can see some dashed circle here that are, are um, Extraction region for the spectrum uh, that we uh, further doing analysis to try to figure out the statistics of complex real molecules. This is one example um, of our data, this RS481. Um, so we observe uh, many, many lines, uh, especially in this wide continuum band. It turns out finding continuum in this band is a little bit challenging. Um, and we also have some broad lines, this is probably due to uh, outflows in SIO. Um, we can also clearly see that this line, this misoformula line is a little bit optimistic uh, because you see other lines, uh, misoformula line match, the, the model match the data pretty well. Um, so this is just what we're looking at, some sources, uh, I will show another source later on, but some sources you just see a lot of noise. And some sources we even think that uh, there's some absorption there, probably due to a uh, high opacity of the source. So, to derive a uh, complex uh, 
potency of each model is spectrum, you uh, uh, we first identify sort of the species. So we have a list of a predefined uh, species. And then we use that class to perform LT uh, modeling, uh, try to model the, our data. We assume the source size of 0.5 seconds. And the, the three parameters in our modeling are uh, quantity and one width primarily. And then we run the modeling for five different excitation temperatures. So that's the key thing because we only have a limited coverage. So our ability to determine the excitation temperature is pretty poor. Um, so we basically pick a typical range of excitation temperature that we have in, in the literature and just do a fitting for all five of them. And then we take the range of the fitted column density as the answer to those columns. So before I go into the column density plot, I want to show just a little bit about the detection rates that we have. So this, this plot summarizes uh, so the, all the species uh, that we think we can uh, confidently identify uh, versus all of the source. So this is sorted by uh, the continuum brightness temperature. So on the right here is high continuum temperatures, and on the right, uh, on the left is low continuum temperature. And you can kind of see there's some kind of rough trend here. You see a very rich source is kind of populating in this end of the graph, um, but we still, in some cases, we can still see uh, complex where we have molecules on the left hand side of the graph. So the color code is like the, the green one are sulfur bearing single organics. Blue is carbon chain. Uh, all of the red here are complex organic without uh, nitrogen. And this magenta here is nitrogen bearing complex organic molecule. And up here in the grays are single organics like uh, uh, CS and H30CN. And so just uh, putting some statistics, statistics here, we found methanol is detecting about 60% of the source, so it's pretty commonly detected. And about one third of the source actually have more than three kinds of columns. And nitrogen bearing columns is also quite uh, common. So almost half of the source have, have the nitrogen bearing columns. And one thing is, um, yeah, so uh, one thing is quite interesting. I mean, it's not surprising is that this, the, the brightest source uh, actually has a lot of absorption, uh, which is, uh, so spoiler, spoiler alert, and this is, we all know this already, this is RS482. Um, what is this? Yeah, 482 or 481. Yeah. So this is 481. Yeah, so so I have a mislabel in the previous plot. Yeah, that's 482. Um, so this is a high opacity source that um, I'm going to show a plot of that later. Um, so we can kind of dissect this detection statistic later uh, with, with other. Um, uh, evolutionary indicator. So this is with volumetric temperature. You start to see um, the kind of we don't see this like left and right uh, difference in this plot. Uh, and so we, we conclude that there's no obvious correlation with uh, volumetric uh, temperatures. Uh, but we found that there's the high volumetric temperature source have very little common effect. But we also have very small numbers of statistics here. And for volumetric luminosity. Um, we also don't see a clear correlation here, uh, but we kind of can say that lower luminosity have a, a fewer calm detected, but that's probably due to um, sensitivity issues. Um, we also uh, check the plot with uh, our detection statistic, statistic with the, the millimeter continuum mass uh, measured in the Van Den survey. So we achieve a very similar population as we sorted by the continuum temperatures. So we have the, the higher mass of source have more columns detected, while the lower mass source um, have a, a fewer columns detected. Um, but again, we need to have to keep in mind that the sensitivity might be might be the uh, might be the reason here. And we, by doing this, we are not um, we are not actively isolating our factors. Okay, so this is our our story one, uh, like I showed before. So the, the spectrum looked like. Pretty flat in some regions, and but we start to see a lot of the deep uh, absorption here and here. And for a simple organic, you see very deep absorption. And so this is the case where you have very optimistic continuum that's blocking the emission of complex organic molecules. And yes, you found before already uh, by uh, Dupin uh, last year that shows that this pretty uh, uh, beautiful uh, difference between these two sources, and one of them. Uh, 
which we saw before is like basically don't have calm, but we think now the thing they do, it just they are being blocked by calm. Okay, so I'm uh, going to the continuum dense uh, calm density. Uh, going to the calm density. Um, here I'm plotting methanol uh, versus methyl cyanide as the plot I showed you before uh, in, a, in a Calypso survey, where they also only have a few points, maybe less, close to 10 detection here. But now uh, we have a lot more point and plot some up, uh, upper limit here. We, we also um, see this very tight uh, correlation between these two models. And this is quite interesting because uh, methanol has a very clear IC origins, while uh, methyl cyanide does not really. Um, the I think that the the formation for methyl cyanide is still in debate, but it does not have a clear IC origin uh, already. So um, the basic idea is that these two molecules does not necessarily have the same origins uh, chemically, but they also show really tight correlation uh, as, as we observe. And we, we put together a, sort of a group of four molecules um, that we have the most detection. So it will be methanol, methyl cyanide, uh, methyl uh, formate, and dimethyl ether here. So you can see that they are more or less correlated uh, with each other. Um, the dimethyl ether and methyl formate also have pretty really tight correlation, which is not surprising. Um, they are both star species from methanol. Um, and other uh, plot has a little bit larger scatter, but they also have um, fairly good uh, correlation. But so here I'm plotting just column density versus column density. But column density need to be uh, normalized uh, by the basically the, the gas density around the source. So we use uh, we use the top continuum brightness temperature as normalizing normalization factor, basically as a probe to um, column density of the gas or column density of molecular gas. So when we do that uh, for the same methyl cyanide versus methyl uh, methanol, we get uh, the same pre type correlation. We also try to take, so this is basically the abundance ratio. We, we take that abundance ratio uh, to normalize by uh, two different evolutionary indicators, so um, elbow and people. Um, we also have pre type correlation for this same pair of molecules. Um, so this my one example shows that oh these two um, evolution in here does not really um, it's not really doing, uh, it's not very really impactful for for uh, the correlation of molecules it's not either um, um, make the, the 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 scatter more randomized or it's not even make the, the correlation tighter uh, for other type other set of molecules so here it's methyl cyanide versus Times so ether, you can see uh, the effect of the normalization for elbow and people uh, is kind of moving the correlation uh, strengths up and down a bit. And so the basic conclusion here is that we don't think elbow and people are dominating factor uh, to, to for the um, abundance ratio of complex organ molecules. And beside the four molecules we show here, we also have a lot more. So I'm now going to show you all of them because uh, we're still trying to figure them out. So, but we also have um, a lot more molecule here and we can, um, if we have a good uh, chemical model, uh, we can uh, try to look into that and see uh, if those ratio make sense or not. Okay, so from the, from the correlation plot, and we can draw a line, basically do a linear fit, uh, we can derive the ratio. And so let me go back to this plot, I showed this plot before, this is uh, a survey done by uh, Bergner in 2019, and I take out the column where the model we're not detecting in our survey. And here's a, another survey that she did uh, a few years before. It's a single dish survey. And because we can derive ratio, we can put our numbers sort of on this kind of graph to see uh, whether they are consistent. So the blue bars here are the sort of the, the range of ratio we got from our data. Uh, it is quite consistent with uh, her serpent survey, and it, it is not consistent uh, with those uh, typical hot you know, and it's also show a higher abundance ratio for those typical hot you know. uh, Here, and also um, quite consistent with some of, like, say, missile cyanide and uh, acetaldehyde, quite similar. And uh, for 
misoforming that means what user who are having a, a higher amount of ratio. Um, but this this is from a single day survey, so uh, a lot of big dilution factor for 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 molecule can be can can be a factor here. Uh, so basically, we we think a very similar um, chemistry uh, as a separate survey for a mini survey, uh, but we don't see the same chemistry as um, as the typical hardware you know, sources. One um, one bit of exciting thing, or the interesting thing, is that once we plot this ratio, uh, uh, yeah, so this is a four pair of molecules, so uh, methyl cyanide versus methanol, dimethyl ether versus methanol, uh, methyl formate versus methanol, and this is dimethyl ether versus um, methyl formate. And I'm plotting here as a, as a function of continuum temperature. And you can clearly see this arise uh, in these two graph here. And, but the rise here is maybe not prominent, or you can probably just draw a straight line for it along these data points. We also can see a clear trend here. So um, one thing to note that is uh, methyl formate and dimethyl ether are both daughter molecules of methanol. So they, can, they are formed from methanol. Methanol is one of the uh, ingredients to make those uh, more complex molecules. And uh, there's, a, there's basically a two scenario <clears throat> we're thinking for explaining this rise here. One is that uh, methyl, methanol has actually become more optically fit uh, to a high uh, continuum uh, source, so you basically have a drop down of uh, uh, methanol. The other reason could be that some methanol in, in a high temperature region or in a brighter source actually being converted into uh, the, their target species. So some of your methanol has turned into uh, methyl formate, so you, you naturally have this rise in this ratio here. And so in that sense, it kind of makes sense because you don't see a variation um, in the ratio of these two dark species. And for methyl formate and methanol, uh, we're not expecting to see such conversion uh, factor because they are not uh, that much close like, related chemically. Okay, um, so uh, I think I mentioned, uh, but kind of close, related to Bob's question, uh, there's been um, thinking about trying to look for the ice in, in uh, pro starch to basically probe uh, the ice composition just before it becomes thermally absorbed and to see uh, if we recover uh, or can we say they are actually coming just from the ice uh, so that kind of prove. The, the, the gas grain reaction making those columns, or maybe there's some other reaction we're not we find, uh, fully figure out. So it's very hard to make connection from this absorption spectrum from ice to the gas phase. So um, hopefully, uh, Jeff Webb can, uh, can launch someday and we'll be able to uh, uh, survey many pro -star. This is from one of the, uh, the early release size programs, so they're going to do a few sources uh, in a bit detail and try to provide the, the tools and the modeling for the community to look for uh, further look for uh, the ice features in uh, mean near infrared too. And I think this has previous synergy to the gas-based columns that we observed with them. Um... Okay, so to conclude that, uh, I think it's a very, uh, we can kind of draw the chemical evolution uh, um, in prostar in this very simple graph when you have Time goes in this way, but also its radius in this way because as the particle or gas particle can move uh, um, toward the center uh, as the because of collapse. And so, as you move toward the center, your temperature goes up, and so that's kind of dominating your formation pathway. That according to what kind of density your the, the gas parcel is experience and also the temperature. So you have very different uh, kind of broad chemical. Uh, Reaction can happen, and you have photodissociation, other parts of the radiation field, freeze out, that's where probably a lot of both, uh, ice become more complex, and then you have evaporation to put it into the gas phase. So we can see it, and maybe the further from, uh, chemical reaction in gas phase um, that are going to determine the composition model we see. And so, to kind of briefly summarize our survey so far, uh, is that among our sample, we found 60% source of methanol, that's pretty widely uh, under, 
About one third source have uh, three cons, so they are very complex or okay, molecule rich. And nitrogen bearing molecule actually fly commonly observed in uh, almost four, uh, half of the source. And we found significant correlation between ethanol and methyl cyanide and, and methyl formate and dimethyl ether. And so these two, well, the type correlation may be due to chemistry, but these, the type correlation between these two molecules, because they, they, they are not necessarily have the same origin. Um, so it kind of calls into question about what this correlation actually mean um, in the context of the chemistry. Maybe there are other um, uh, effects we're not fully understand yet. Um, to uh, lead to this very tight correlation between these two molecules. Um, Prosthetic properties such as elbow and T-ball are not very impactful uh, for the common abundance we observe. Uh, it's been also shown in previous study, either with single dish or uh, uh, surveys with interferometry as well. And for the source with high uh, continuum temperatures, uh, we found the dark species is a little bit enhanced or um, the methanol start become optimistic. So the dark species become in hand the suggestion that there may be some additional processing of methanol that we're not um, uh, we, we're not fully constrained yet. Maybe it's, it's due to the warm-up phase, it's, it's better converting methanol to, to uh, methyl formate than methyl ether, or perhaps there's further reactions uh, once the methanol is leaving the dust brain. And finally, the future uh, minute observation like Gen 2 uh, we can do a detailed uh, observation of ice composition, and that is prior to absorption uh, of those ice containing complex organic molecules, and then we can try to make the direct connection to the complex we observe. Uh, in those sources, we actually see the gas phase uh, uh, um, complex organic molecules. So, by using multi wavelengths, we're actually seeing the multi um, uh, stage uh, of a chemical evolution. All right, uh, thank you. So, uh, I'll take your question. So, any question for you? Uh, yes, uh, in the pH samples, are uh, all these uh, objects in the, uh, in which stage are they including uh, class one objects? Yeah, they are. They include class one objects. Um, so I remember you mentioned in previous survey, uh, you are, uh, other team look for cones. Um, they do not find the uh, high fraction of cones detected yeah. in the sample. And how about in your sample? We don't see such a identical plot, but we don't see such a division, uh, class zero and class one. Um, we didn't show the the class one class like class zero class one like plot because um, the, the 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 line between class zero and class one is often a little bit blurred. So we we that's why we use like elbow and t ball and try to as the evolution in here. And you don't clearly see that like one part just don't have any molecule detected. So that's a sign of like. We don't see such clear cut, but they also probably uh, because of their source selection, maybe they're so like a little bit, a little bit more evolved than so called early class one. It's still a range of class one. Yeah. Okay. So um, in your sample, also including like class two. We don't have class two. Okay. Probably. Okay. Thank you. So any other question? So you have shown us uh, the six, uh, sixty-seven p result. So how's that compared to other common? In our survey? I mean, I mean, in the survey before, I mean. Um, so I think for for combat, for combat itself, you already have three large scattered. There's some some complex ring molecule is not detecting in one molecule, one comet, it's detecting other comets. Uh, I think 67P has become such uh, the kind of the source we, we tend to use as a comparison is it has a much uh, comprehensive measurements from the mass uh, spectrometer. Uh, so I think and that and it's mostly due to the lack of sampling and we just don't have a good sense of what the common uh, chemical composition of the common uh, period. Uh, like we all, for 67P as well, uh, we also only get learn about the surface and then we need to think about whether it's layering structure, are we actually probing the, the kind of bulk property of the common as well. Uh, any one last question? Yeah. So how does the boundless ratio of VA and V3 already compare with your class one and class one? We haven't done that yet, but um, 
that could be convert. And we can also look for, we're also looking for potentially outbursting towards in our sample as well. I just see if, uh, if they show different kinds of um, But if, if, okay, so if, if, it, if the outburst is like thermally just increase to say 100 Kelvin radius, and assuming that's a fairly short time, and uh, one possibility is that you don't really see a chemical change. You basically just get more material, right? So unless you have uh, chemical gradients uh, in radius, you don't really expect to see such a big change in the bounce ratio. Okay, I think it's time to close the program. So let's check out the speaker.